Good morning and welcome to this special broadcast of Newsroom Channel 405. We build up now to the funeral service of the late Archbishop Emeritus Desmond Tutu. I'm Michelle Craig. Welcome. Good morning. I'm Stephen Fritis and a happy new year to you as we enter 2022 in perhaps the most appropriate way by paying tribute to a man as special as Archbishop Emeritus Desmond Tutu. We're honored, in fact, privileged to have in our studios with us this morning, ahead of the funeral service, uh, the Archbishop, uh, the Anglican Bishop of Johannesburg, uh, Reverend Dr. Stephen Morero, the right Reverend, I should say, also Professor Klippis Kritzinger, Professor of Theology at ELISA. Gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for coming in on this special day and for agreeing to spend time with us. I really do appreciate it. Perhaps um, one of the big questions that underpins the life of the Arch is a question around religion and politics. And they completely intersect at almost every level. They're about hierarchies, they're about decision making, they're about the very idea of a congregation, of people being together, which is also about politics. Um, Bishop, perhaps I may put this question to you first. At what point does the politics start and the religion end? Or does the religion ever end? And does the politics begin later? Well, thank you, Stephen, and uh, Happy New Year to you and to the viewers. And thank you for inviting us. Um, and again, I can only um, draw from Archbishop Tutu. Mm. He, his theological departure point is that God has created everyone in God's image. Mm. And you can therefore ne not separate religion uh, from uh, politics. Uh, we, we are not just religious people. We are social beings as well. Also, we are political beings. And if you start by trying to put them in, into co compartments, it's, 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 it's not mm. going to reflect the whole of us. Uh, so therefore, you, you cannot separate them. Mm. Yeah. Historically speaking, Prof. Kretzinger, the decisions made by the church, and Stephen and I were discussing this off air, mm. the decisions made by the church at a particular time in South Africa's history, they were not apolitical. For example, when the arch was appointed in positions of leadership within the Anglican okay. Church. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. Let me also say thank you for the invitation and happy New Year. We hope this will be a better year Absolutely. than the previous one. Yes. Um, well, yes. Um, bishop, uh, the, the Bishop of Pretoria was saying that at the time, 1986, when he was mm -hmm. appointed Archbishop. Um, the Anglican Church was criticizing the apartheid government, but it was actually an all-white leadership mm. at the time. So it, it was not credible in its critique of, of the political structures when it was replicating it in its, own, in its own ranks, and therefore was in a sense under pressure to appoint a black leader. Mm. But, and then there were so many um, capable black bishops that were already in, uh, serving the church. So it, it wasn't you know, and just under political pressure, but you can never separate the political and, uh, and the religious in that sense, because the members of the church are, as the bishop has said, political beings, they're cultural beings, they are economic beings, and so religion is about life, lived um, before the face of God, in the presence of God, in other words, accountable to someone beyond the, the, the political, um, but about the political. I mean, so polis, uh, the Greek word means city, so the political is what is about the, the affairs of the city, the common good. Mm. Mm -hmm. And so religion has everything to do with the common good and with life as, as a whole. Mm. Um, it seems to me, uh, and perhaps I can put this to you, Bishop, that, that when one thing happens, you know what will happen next. And mm -hmm. Let me give you an example in more recent times. Yeah. If you appoint in the Anglican Church or the Catholic Church a priest who uh, identifies in public as being gay, you know that within four or five years there will be pressure to appoint a bishop who is gay. The same could easily be argued. You appoint a female priest within days, weeks, years, it's going to be that there's going to be pressure to appoint a female bishop. Um, it's, it's hard now to remember how controversial all of that was. Um, but a hundred years ago, more, the real issue would have been about appointing black people, only men then, as priests. Mm. Um, and mm. that would then follow as to what happens next, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Mm. Mm. 
you know, as, 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 as Prof. Sharon with us and uh, listening to your question, um, I, my experience within the Anglican Church is that there are a number of issues that, as the church, we need to continue to deal with. Mm. Um, and we cannot deal with them at, 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 mm. in, in one, at, at one go. We knew, some of us, that when we started about uh, looking at black leadership within our church, there were going to be other issues coming, mm. women issues, the um, gay and lesbian issues. Um, and there are other issues that are going to come uh, of how do we express our traditions and our cultures within the church and dealing also with the, uh, the English way of, of doing church in Africa. Mm -hmm. So, so mm -hmm. there, there are a number of issues that are still there. Mm. Uh, so it's just at a particular point, and in the case of Archbishop Tutu, uh, he was not elected because he was black, but, mm. but we, mm. at that time we said we need to have a black leader. Mm. Uh, but he was elected because... As Prof said, we have capable leaders, mm -hmm. and and some of, of us we kept on saying, you know, it seems as if the Holy Spirit, she is unfair, mm -hmm. that in her elections, she seems to be always looking at the white uh, parishioners within our church and mm -hmm. appoint them, mm -hmm. and 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 at that time, the, you know, the, the political us came into into the space to say, hey guys we should actually mobilize each other so that we must make sure that we get a, a black leader, but not only a black leader, a black leader who leads us mm. into where we are mm. at that time mm. in South Africa wow. uh, with credi credibility. Mm. Wow. And in a way, I suppose, what Tutu, what the arch did, uh, sorry if I interrupted. No, 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 that's fine. Was he made it impossible not to choose him because mm. he'd already been the Bishop of Lesotho he, it was, he was, I think I read somewhere, more qualified, uh, no, no one had ever been more qualified than him in the positions he was in. So what he did is he created the situation where he could not be chosen, he could not not be chosen, he had to be chosen. Oh yes, oh yes. Um, and I think even the context at that time, Stephen, uh, we, we needed uh, a, a leader of his caliber mm. to take us as a church uh, from one point to the other. Uh, I remember that the, when he became Archbishop, the, the, the issue that he had to deal with was ordaining of women. Mm. And he, he, was, his, he was in the forefront with that mm. one. Mm -hmm. and, and he kept on pushing. Uh, he didn't just let us as the church to, to remain in our comfort zone as, as men mm. uh, in, in the church. Mm. I suppose the next question for me is if, if we can stay with the appointment of, of a black Archbishop yes. for, for just a moment. In that setting, 1986, yeah. how would that have been received by parishioners? Because how are you led in church by a black archbishop um, when the rest of your country is in the state that it's in? When, are, you a different, are you a different being as a parishioner versus on the streets of South Africa in 1986? When you talk about parishioners here, you're talking about black or white parishioners? I suppose I'm primarily talking about white parishioners. Mm. Prof, I'm sure in your reading as well, um, and my own experience is that we would talk about Bishop Tutu as the bishop of the church. And the first enemy that he had to deal with, it was not the apartheid government, mm. in my view. Mm. It was how do you deal with the members within the church and the body of Christ? Mm. Uh, I said in my speech on um, two days ago that it, it was us, the members of the church, who labeled him as a false prophet mm. Mm. and also sure. as a communist. Mm. Growing up in the Western Transvaal then, mm. uh, whenever I said, when I was at college, whenever I said I'm training as a minister within the Anglican church, you know, the... the the Afrikaners in that area, they will say, as ye fan tutu kerk. But it was not only the Africans, but also within mm. the Anglican Diocese of Johannesburg, mm. where uh, they, there were some per parishes and parishioners mm -hmm. who said they are not going to give money 
to the Diocese of Johannesburg because he was going to use it to achieve mm. his communist ideology. Mm. Uh, it, it, it was sad. Uh, but, but Bishop Tutu being Bishop Tutu, he, he mm. just kept on going on. I gave, uh, if I may share this story, which I shared with the, with, at the memorial service. At one stage, he received a very rude letter from a white parishioner in, in our diocese. And he read this letter, um, and ref he was a, a man of great reflection. He did, he did not just uh, react. And after read, reading that letter, which was handwritten, he looked at it and he said, Wow. This human being has got such a beautiful handwriting. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what was his response? I was working with him at the cathedral. His response was, thank you for your letter. And I thank God for your beautiful handwriting. Yours, wow. Desmond. Wow. <laughs> wow. So, at, you see, we needed a leader mm. at that time who... Uh, could unify the church before we become powerful in our prophetic mm. ministry. Yes. Mm. And what a job it was. It, it, mm. wasn't, it mm. wasn't easy. Mm. Perhaps I should say what a job it is. Professor, the way that, um, and I mean, and I remember, I'm old enough to remember, I was, I was a teenager, even younger than that at the time when he became the Archbishop, and I, I did grow up in, in that church. Um, and I remember some of the opposition, I remember some of the support, sometimes from surprising quarters, you exactly. know, it's not yeah, always yeah. where you think these things will come from. Mm. But that was then, Professor, if I remember correctly, it was also used by the apartheid government. They spread things, they used Stratcom, they used, you know, one or two newspapers that you know, the Louis Lake may have formed at the time. Um, they did all sorts of things. Um, for the apartheid government to have a black person in such authority, this is not just, you know, earthly authority. This is religion. This matters. Um, over white parishioners. And then accepting him in the main, I mean, with, with the opposition that you mentioned. This must, have be, uh, this must have been impossible for them to manage. And in the end, it was impossible for them to manage. Mm. Mm. Yes, I think the um, Nobel Peace Prize, of course, in 1984, <coughs> that started this embarrassment for the apartheid government, that the whole world seems to be recognizing him. And then the, the Anglican Church itself elects him. Mm. Um, so so the, um, the cartoons in the Afrikaans newspapers at the time, I mean, cartoonists always exaggerate, of course, mm. you know, but um, they were vicious. In, uh, and I think part of this, the problem that, that we had, and... I don't think we still have it, but th this anti-communism mm. uh, was, was so deeply ingrained in, um, in all whites in South Africa. This wasn't just an Afrikaner problem. Mm. It was particularly strong among the Afrikaners, but you also had a strong English. Mm. That's sort of the mm. colonial mm. Um, legacy mm. of South Africa, <coughs> which we, and that we're still struggling with. Mm. So the decolonizing, uh, which is a, a strong theme in, in also in, in uh, black theology and mm. African theology today, um, is how to overcome that legacy. But you know, certainly the uh, apartheid government uh, struggled with that. The Afrikaans churches had, had the same antagonism against uh, Archbishop Tutu. It was at the Rustenburg Conference in 1990 when um, th this was now, the, you know, in 1960 there was the Cottesloe Conference mm. after, uh, after Sharpeville. Mm. So 30 years later, now the, the, meet, the uh, political parties are unbanned. So the churches had to get together, and the World Council of Churches helped to organize this. So now, what do we do? How do we mm. view this change? Is it okay? <coughs> and uh, <coughs> a very Jonker, uh, Afrikaner theologian from Stellenbosch then, after his speech, he, he apologized <coughs> to all black South Africans for apartheid mm. uh, on behalf of himself and the church and sort of Afrikaners in general. And the, the archbishop then did the astounding thing of... Um, going up and embracing him and saying, I forgive sure, you. Sure. Sure. And everybody, not everybody, many people criticized him and said, how can you, as a bishop, forgive? Mm. I mean, who gives you, for the first, in the first instance, who gives Vilyonka the, the yeah. right to confess mm. on behalf of the Dutch Reformed mm. Church or yeah. the Afrikaners? But he said, and he defended himself, the arch, he said, well, if somebody confesses, I have to forgive. Mm. So um, he, he sort of started, and then the, the Dutch Reformed Church 
started changing the view of, of mm. Bishop Tutu. They then started saying, well, maybe he isn't this ogre mm. that, he thought he wa that we thought he was. Because the fact that he did that in public, mm. um, sticking his neck out that far, mm. and the Black Dutch Reformed Church mm. at the time were, were scathing in the criticism of, of mm. Bishop Tutu. Mm. Um, <clears throat> but he, he did those kind of things to literally move the furniture, to not the, the walls, to push out the walls. Mm. And I think that helped to a large extent in getting Afrikaners to, to sort of vote in that referendum for the New Deal. Mm. So in there, there, religion has a huge yeah. effect in mm. politics. Mm. There's a, a certain power, uh, and we, you talk about the symbolism of this moment, of this Afrikaans theologian, and it wouldn't have worked if his first language had been English and his surname had been Smith, if you know what I mean. It needed to be someone from uh, uh, defolk the people. Um, and seen as such. And it had to be, it, it, it also wouldn't have worked if someone else had, had, accepted the authority, had accepted the apology. It had to be a black religious leader of the stature of Tutu. And I, I, I've often wondered if Tutu had an understanding of symbols that, that, that maybe I've never had. Um, and Bishop has the idea of being a priest dressed in what a, what a priest wears. You know that. I mean, you walk in, we know who you yeah. are. Um, um, against the apartheid police at the time must have been incredibly powerful because no one, I mean, is going to ever use violence against a priest and get away with it. Hmm. You know, when the apartheid police could use violence against everyone else and get away with it. He, it seems to me he had a huge appreciation of the power of that symbol. Hmm. Stephen, um, when we are ordained as priests in the Anglican Church, when the bishop lay hands on you, the, there's powerful words that, that the bishop says. Mm. Those whose sins you forgive, mm. they are forgiven. And those sins you retain, they are retained. Sure. Mm. So, so you, you have a choice mm. as, as a priest. No matter what the person do to you, you have a choice. You, cho you choose to forgive them, and you know that when you forgive them, God also forgives them. Mm. But if you retain them, God will retain their sin. Mm. So it, it is not just being a priest. Mm. At that moment, you are encouraged by the church to say, make a choice. What is that thing which you want to give to the people of God, whether they are religious or not religious? Mm. Whoever sins against you, you choose. And I think Bishop Tutu, in his life, he took that very serious mm. to forgive whoever sinned against him, within the yeah. church and outside yeah. the church. Bishop, mm. you know, what would that have taken? B because everything that we're, we're talking about this morning and, and the reflections we've had mm. of the arch over the past week since his passing, has spoken to this big picture thinking to the extent of very few people that we know. Thinking so far outside of the box of the time that he was operating in. What you've just said about forgiveness at a time like the one that you've just described a moment ago, a uh, prof. Yes, he's a bishop at the time, but he's also human. What would that have taken? given what he had witnessed from the hands of the apartheid government, the extent of the violence, the extent of the brutality, to say, I forgive you. My um, experience of him, uh, working with him at, in the cathedral for eight months, and my experience of him as a leader in the church, I think for me, Prof, it was he understood who God is to him. Hmm. A forgiving God. Mm -hmm. A loving God. Um, if you go to his um, home in Soweto, uh, there is a, a small chapel there. I think that is where he, he always went into that space, spoke to God, and uh, received and accepted the love and forgiveness mm -hmm. of God. Because you can only give what you have received and what you understand. If you understand that God is a loving God, 
What else can you give? You'll give love. If you understand that God is forgiving, you'll give forgiveness. And you'll never retain uh, uh, you know, that which is wrong in you and, and hope to grow in the love of God. Mm. Um, I, this, this whole week since he passed on, I, um, we have been concentrating on uh, Bishop Tutu as this public mm -hmm. person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, but what kept him going is that he balanced his life his public ministry and his private ministry, which is that he, he had this amazing discipline to be in prayer every day, to um, have Holy Eucharist every day, and even in prayer every day. So he, he had that rhythm of life. You listen to a number of leaders, political leaders. Uh, the other day I spoke to uh, Dr. Ivan Koza of uh, PSL. Um, at 12 o'clock, he doesn't care how serious the meeting is. At 12 o'clock, he will just say, stop, let us pray. <laughs> Whether you are a believer, communist, mm. whatever, he believed in that, that rhythm, uh, which he was taught by the, the CR fathers uh, from, mm. from England, the mm. community of resurrection. Mm. And all the people that he taught, mentored, they are keeping to that rhythm of mm. life. So privately he made sure that he is balanced he is stable before he goes out into the public and i think that is what we lack with the leadership within the church and outside the church how do we how do i deal with the stiff morale in me before i go out into the public wow mm. Yes, I think that personal spirituality of his was, yeah. was the secret. Um, mm. I read this week, and mm. we all started reading his sermon. <laughs> yes, yes. Again. yes. <laughs> How, at, uh, when he was um, 16, 17 years old and had contracted TB mm -hmm. and was in the hospital, and Trevor Huddleston had mm. come and visited him on a weekly basis, he says. I think that's why he actually became a Christian or remained a Christian, is that, that loving care also of a white person. Mm. So I think his anti-racism was sort of ingrained in him as a, as a young believer, as a young human being. But he then, the, the, the doctor said to Trevor Huddleston, we don't think your young friend is going to make it. So he said, it was really touch and go whether he would survive. Mm -hmm. And then he says, he writes, uh, the Archbishop, I, I then pray to God and say, God, if I'm going to live, that's okay. And if, it, if I'm not going to live, that's also okay. And he says, then an amazing calmness came over me. Listen, I think that was the secret of his life. He had learned how to die and therefore he could live. Wow. And maybe mm. that is yeah. the secret of, of, for all of us. If you, are able, if you are prepared to die, then you're ready to really live beyond yourself, to live for others. So the compassion that he ex experienced from, from the Trevor Trev Huddleston and, and others, that was then sort of ingrained in you, you care for those who suffer. Mm -hmm. That's what he experienced, and that's what he then did the rest of his life. And he sustained it in a daily discipline of prayer and, and meditation. And that also attracted him to, to other spiritualities mm -hmm. like the Dalai yeah. Lama yeah. and others. Uh, he, he found kindred spirits of people who actually are at peace within themselves mm -hmm. and are not just chasing power or, uh, or money or, or, you know, popularity. Quite a thing to do for the leader of one religion to spend so much time with the leader of another religion <laughs> that's easier now than it was maybe 50 years ago, perhaps. I mean, it, depending on where you are. Um, but for him to also criticize his own government for its treatment over the, over the leader of another religion, mm -hmm. it's a big move. Eh? Mm -hmm. Is it, Bishop? Yeah, it is. Um, I think it's because of... Uh, just his understanding of what it is to be human, um, mm. created in the, in the image of God. I mean, you, c you cannot deny somebody um, access to visit a friend. Mm. It does feel to me, in many ways, that we're discussing someone who is otherworldly. <laughs> yes. it, it, it's outside of the realm, perhaps, of understanding that, it, that, that extent of forgiveness that extent of humanity. I'm going to ask both of our guests 
to please stay with us here in studio this morning. The Right Reverend Dr. Stephen Moreo is the Bishop of the Anglican Diocese of Johannesburg and Prof. Klippi Sklitzinger, uh, Professor of Theology at UNI. So we're live throughout the morning in Cape Town as well.